Welcome to the second in a series of backstory podcasts on the topic of early childhood learning in Longmont. My name is Tim Waters, and I've been invited by the Longmont Observer and the Longmont Public Media to moderate conversations of leaders, advocates, experts, and policymakers on topics of interest and relevance to Longmont residents. This month, we're focusing on young families with young children. Concerned that, as a community, we're failing both because of insufficient childcare and early childhood learning opportunities in Longmont. Not that this group is failing them. More globally, we have too many kids who are not experiencing what they need to experience. Every story about an issue or a problem, you read it in the newspaper or read on the Longmont Observer website, has a backstory. A backstory that is typically more interesting and engaging than what gets reported as news. So this month we're telling a story that is understood all too well by moms, dads, and grandparents with children and grandchildren under the age of six. It's a story that's less well understood by business owners and primary employers, but one with huge implications for them. It's one that seldom draws the kind of intensity and attention and support it deserves from local policymakers. Because of its implications for nearly every goal or objective, the school board members, city council members, and county, mission, county commissioners establish when setting priorities is why we're, we're doing these podcasts, because it's so important. Indeed, this is, this is a backstory of a challenge so complex and pervasive, of such consequence and of such significance, that we're telling it in a series of no less than three podcasts. We'll see if we add to this series after we finish number three. These will be produced and posted in sequence on the Observer website and Longmont's YouTube channel, as well as Longmont Public Media. Our hope, and I guess Channel 8 now, as uh, it's up and ready to go. Our hope is that all Longmont and Boulder County residents will understand what's at stake for all of us if we don't get this right for the youngest of us. Today I'm joined by four, not three, we have one drop out, Ann Maka, uh, who is the curator of education at the museum, called in uh, with that virus that everybody's dealing with right now. So we have three outstanding experts this morning. Amy Ogilvy is executive director of Wild Plum, one of Longmont's premier preschool programs and our uh, primary Head Start program. She, she's running a pretty complex program. Matt Eldred, Executive Director of the Learning Center. Olga Bermudez is the Community Coordinator for Prevention, chil, uh, for Prevention hyphen, Children, Youth, and Families for the City of Longmont. It is involved in all things uh, City of Longmont with respect to early childhood education. So let's start by learning a little bit more. I mean, you all bring extraordinary expertise and background to this. Give us an idea of why you're in this space and who you are. You want to start? Sure, I can start. Um, I'm Amy Ogilvie. I'm the executive director of the Wild Plum Center. Um, I have been in early childhood education for 15 years after about 20 years working with teenagers. So what I really found was that working with teenagers we were trying to intervene at a much later time and that if we had done a better job in the early years with ensuring good brain development and reducing traumatic experiences, preparing children for school, we wouldn't have needed to intervene with as many teenagers as we did. So I made the switch about 15 years ago to working in early childhood education because of that. All right. Olga? My name is Olga Edmundes and I've been with the city of Long for 11 years. So I have a master's degree in uh, psychology. And I really believe in the prevention. I really believe that, you know, the whole country spends a lot of money in intervention. But I really believe that we can make a big difference if we really invest in prevention. So that's what I'm here because I really believe that we invest in the little kids. We really get them ready so we're going to be able to be successful and they're going to be able to thrive in our community. All right. Yeah. My name is Matt Eldred. I'm the executive director at TLC Learning Center, a 65-year-old nonprofit early childhood center here in Longmont. And my early childhood experience and background probably goes back to when I was a kid. I, I remember having foster kids in my home when I was probably in second, third grade. So I think I've been doing early childhood my whole life. I went to school uh, for um, early childhood special education and PE, and then I couldn't decide which age group I liked. So my degrees are in special education and physical education, K-12. And then I went and did a master's in school administration. So I started working with um, adults with disabilities in college as kind of a way to pay the bills. Became the director of that program before I graduated from college and then uh, moved here to Colorado in 2000. I've been working in youth services and early childhood services since we moved to Colorado in 2000. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm biting my tongue because I, having spent a lifetime in, in education, administration, and working with folks, 
I was going to make a comment about the difference between working with adults and young children and where the biggest challenges are. Yeah. But I won't make a comment. That's a different topic. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right, here we go. More substance uh, specifically uh, relevant to the things we're doing in Longmont and in the Longmont area. Uh, and to start with, I just want to remind folks that Longmont City Council has adopted seven goals for the city, and this panel is aware of these. The goals include priorities like housing, economic development, environmental protection, and workforce preparation. One of the goals that we'll have an integrated systems approach that leverages human social capital to provide high-quality pre-K learning opportunities for all of our children so that they have a good start in life. Uh, some may wonder why that's a goal that a city would set. So Olga is the, the key person in the city staff who, who helps to translate that goal to reality. Why, why would we have that goal and what does it mean? Well, why we have that goal is because I really believe that uh, city council members understand that investing in the early childhood education is going to help the city, it's going to help the county to save some money in the long term. So. Uh, through uh, children, youth, and families, we have been work working through this goal and providing high quality trainings and uh, overt trainings. We developed uh, several collaborations uh, with the county, with the Colorado uh, Department of Education, and we are providing um, evidence based training. So there are a lot of trainings in the community, but we are interested in, in trainings that really um, they have been tested and they provide some results. So uh, we did the TSA goal, I don't know if you guys remember that. We uh, worked with the Aspen Center mm -hmm. and uh, the teachers were able to utilize some data right there and implement that with the classroom. So they were able to create some uh, curriculums and get some uh, results right there with the kids. And instead of getting a curriculum that was good for all 20 or 15 kids, it was a little bit more personalized and tailored to the different needs that the kids were having. So we have been making a lot of uh, progress, providing a lot of uh, training support trainings. We also uh, collaborated with the Buell Foundation. We applied for uh, grants and even they increased the amount of money that um, they provided uh, last Last year, we went from 25,000 to 30,000, and that helped us just to provide more training uh, and also uh, enhance some of the programs that we have. For example, we have the, the Reading League, so we have some uh, volunteers. We train them with uh, the school district collaboration, and they go to the school and they read to the kids, you know, for 45 minutes to the kids that have been identified that they need some support. So yes, we are working toward increasing that uh, high quality of uh, open training and opportunities. Uh, for uh, the kids. We also have a program, the Mayor's Book Club. You know, we send some books and the data shows us that 87% of the kids are improving. So we have 487 kids and those 87 is a pretty good number, you know, showing some results. So kids are showing the parents report, we send a pre-test and post-test and parents are saying that the kids, uh, the kids are asking this to be read. So that's an improvement right there. And they know uh, some letters and they know uh, how to read short letters. Right there, we are making a lot of work toward improving the high quality of early childhood education. So I think that's, that's an example of some of the uh, different uh, programs that we have in order just to work out toward that goal. So I'm going to, I'm going to, I want to do a follow-up mm -hmm. on this. And I'll, I want you to all think about this and invite all three of you into the response. Um, and, and I may answer the question myself, <laughs> having, having been in this. I'll, I'll say again for this podcast and for this panel, uh, I, I come to this experience with a volunteer hat on, right? It's, I'm a volunteer for, uh, with the Longmont Observer and now with Longmont Public Media. You all know that I also wear a city council hat. Sometimes it's hard to tell the difference between the two or to take the You also have a little education experience. Well, uh, so I just, this, so I might put my city council hat on mm -hmm. and respond to this, to this question depending on how, how deep you want to go with it. Um, but everything that, that Olga just described, uh, kids more interested in reading, reading scores improving, uh, uh, levels of parent satisfaction, given the things that were just, that she described already. And by the way, those are part of an answer right. uh, to a question I'm going to ask later, and it is how do people get involved? Because mm -hmm. um, I'm guessing you wouldn't mind having more volunteers Absolutely. right, mm -hmm. for the reading league mm -hmm. um, and the other kinds of things that, that we've talked about. Um, but the question for me, with a council hat on, is um, is there a relationship between quality early childhood education and other city of Longmont goals like reducing housing insecurity, strengthening economic That's development right. efforts, mm -hmm. protect the environment, right. assure a well-prepared well workforce? And what I'll add to those 
is a bigger idea of quality of life, right? We hear a lot today uh, in council chambers. We read it in the news, just in conversations. Uh, people concerned about quality of life, and that tr that quickly gets connected to growth that some people see as out of control, homelessness that needs to be solved, um, uh, having to wait too many uh, left turn arrows to get a left turn because I have traffic congestion, um, which are all concerns about the quality of life for generally people who have some. This conversation is about those who we would like to experience more, right, in terms of getting a, a, an early start in life. So what, what do you see as the connections yeah. between a quality start and the other goals that the, that the city council has set? Right. So, I mean, for me, I, what we know is that 90% of brain development happens between the ages of zero and five. So where are our most opportunities or where are our most liabilities in the lack of development or how do we best provide high quality opportunities for kids to develop? So if we know that, if we agree that 90% of this, our brain is happening by the time we turn five, I always tell people that it's not everything I needed to know I learned in kindergarten. Everything I needed to know I learned by the time I started kindergarten. And so if that is true, we know that 90% of our brain is developed. We are learning our, our habits, our tendencies, our negotiating skills, our social skills, or the lack of those things. And so opportunities to high quality early learning and education really gives kids the best chance to succeed, not just be kindergarten ready, but be ready for life. And you talked about the workforce, you talked about homelessness. Uh, if, if our children at two and three and four years old are learning how to play in the sandbox, they will be better prepared to learn in school. They will be less likely to bully in middle school. They will be more likely to communicate as an employer or an employee in life. And ultimately, they'll be a better contributor in our community than than the lack of. Uh, and so all of these things have statistics and demographics with them. We know that kids that have access to early learning opportunities are more likely to graduate from high school. They're less likely to drop out. They're more likely to be employable. Uh, they're more likely to be employable at a higher level. And all these things speak to just the things you're talking about, being able to afford housing, to be able to be, uh, keep and maintain a job, um, less likely to have children at an earlier age. Uh, the teenage pregnancy rate is lower for those that have high quality learning opportunities. Those are all key factors, I think, in very, very early on at two and three and four years old, we're either getting it right or we're not getting it right. And if I look at it from a parent perspective, um, I, I look at it from the perspective of um, a, a parent who has high quality child care for their child is more likely to go to work, mm -hmm. not miss work. Mm -hmm. So it reduces absenteeism from the work environment, which helps with economic development. It helps employers have a stable workforce. There's not as much turnover because parents are able to know that their children are safe, loved, cared for, and getting a great education on top of that. So I think that from a parent perspective and a business perspective, really, the, the early childhood education is critical. If we don't have enough of that, then parents are forced to stay home, which lowers incomes in the community. It makes a smaller workforce of people to be available for employers to hire. So I think that that early child care piece is just as important as things like housing and, and mm -hmm. that kind of thing. So I really believe if the kids are able to thrive and parents are thriving, we're going to have a really strong community. But if we don't provide the, uh, the adequate resources for the parents, parents are going to be not being able to do the job, going to be able to maintain the job, and they're going to be able to, even the kid, you know, just being able to access or have a better job with a good uh, pay scale. So in, in, a, in a county uh, with almost a zero unemployment uh, in every economic development initiative tied to uh, workforce, right? Who's prepared and how many, right, to step into these jobs? What I'm hearing from from this group is um, that over the long run, the, the 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 closer we get to having it right for kids zero to five, every other initiative is strengthened or enhanced. I want to come back just to, for uh, just to actually for me to classify, Matt, some of the skills you were talking about. All that sounds to me like executive function. Mm -hmm. Right, the parts of the brain sure. that give kids a chance to plan, right. to sequence, yeah. to, prob to, to solve problems. Yeah. Yeah. Persist. Persist. Mm -hmm. Well, that's where I was going to go with, with mm -hmm. persistence. What we know, uh, you get that part of the brain right, grit, right? We read right. a lot about right. grit today. Yeah. And the ability for kids to persist 
and overcome over the long run yeah. Trump's IQ points. Yes. Right. Uh, is uh, Trump's is a it's a stronger predictor. Right. Right. There's more uh, more data tied to grit and persistence uh, and uh, in terms of the academic achievement data than a whole bunch of other potential predictors like right. IQ points. Right. All right. So um, we have both formal and, and you two, well, all three of you, formal uh, uh, pre-K learning opportunities. Mm -hmm. uh, most of us would think about that as preschool, right? Mm -hmm. There's also informal education that occurs in conjunction with mm -hmm. or in and in conjunction with and outside of preschool classrooms. Mm -hmm. Um, one, we would have had a panelist this morning, uh, Ann Maka, from the uh, museum as the education uh, curator, but she woke up with that same virus that we're all you know, dealing with right now, and it finally caught up with her. Uh, but she's put together, in partnership with colleagues in the St. Green Valley School District, uh, a killer program, a killer app, right? I mean, they've got a cool, informal education program. Olga, you, how familiar are you with Discovery Days and, and what they've done with, right. with this program? So children and children family, children and the families, we collaborate a lot with, with the museum. So we help them uh, recruiting, we help them uh, with some of the programs. So the idea with Discovery program is being able to have some uh, programs for uh, for anybody in, in the community. So they are open anybody in the community. And also we are uh, trying to look for families that need uh, some resources uh, as well. So in the past we collaborated with, uh, we have a program, the Summer Meals program. So when we have, you know, recreation we have the museum and we have the library and we provide some enrichment activities so the museum have been also part of that so the idea is that we have different activities for all the kids uh, community members can apply for um, the scholarships and they have they range from you know from really uh, learn, uh, early learning to teenagers you know we have uh, teenagers uh, doing uh, learning about theater you know we have uh, kids learning about camping or and other kids learning about the the natives here here in Colorado so it's a really uh, diverse uh, group that they have and a really different variety of programs you know and it's only sports or just all, only about reading it's really uh, they integrate different elements I would also just add that the museum um, is committed to folks who can't typically afford to attend those sorts mm -hmm. of programming right. to get them there so they mm -hmm. give us 40 10 punch mm -hmm. passes every year for our right. families to be able to go out and, and experience those programs and be a part to of benefit them. from the informal learning experiences exactly. along right. with what you're doing mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. all right so talk about yeah. we, we've got some um, pretty, I think, impressive uh, informal education program that has occurred, right? And I know Ann wants to expose, expand that program. Uh, the, the, the other side of the story from the school district is equally as powerful in terms of what they've done. That program works between for discovery days between the museum and the innovation center. Mm -hmm. And then all the other things you've talked about uh, are, show up in those institutions as well. Um, you two bring uh, a vast experience and expertise in terms of formal Right. Preschool learning opportunities. Right. In this case, preschools, right? right. Or uh, pre K, preschools. Right. So, talk to us how would you recognize, yeah. or what would you advise others to look for, like, right. like decision making parents yeah. or policymakers? Right. If we're going to if we're gonna invest more in preschool learning opportunities, formal and informal, right. or pre K learning opportunities, um, what are the best investments, right, mm -hmm. um, that get us the kind of returns we're right. talking about? Right. I think Matt and I both agree quality is the first thing. Mm -hmm. right. um, and as a parent who is out trying to find a child care center, trying to find a preschool, they really want to be looking for quality indicators. Matt and I have done some work to, to really try and define what those are so that parents are able to look for those when they're out um, doing that search. So some of those things include having highly trained staff. Um, Matt and I both have bachelor's degree or higher level staff in our preschool program. So it's, you know, th these folks have gone to early childhood education college, um, that they're using a, re a research-based curriculum with the work that they're doing. So it's not something they've just kind of pieced together and they think the kids might think, you know, looking at rainbows is fun, but that there's really some scaffolding and some sequencing in the learning that the children are doing through those curriculum pieces. Um, we also really believe that a high quality program incorporates the entire family. So they're looking at health, mental health, um, nutrition, the needs of the family, and they're addressing that full 
um, that full range of things. It's not just about drop your kid off and pick your kid up, mm -hmm. that there are many more resources that are being provided to families and, and services for children. Um, children are being screened for disabilities and, and we're making sure that we're catching those concerns early so that they're addressed at a younger age and they don't carry on into the later school years as well. Yeah, I guess I would add to that and I would maybe challenge into the listeners and viewers. Um, when I think of high quality early childhood opportunities, you mentioned pre-K or kindergarten readiness and I, I want us to really think about when, when does that start? And, and in, in my mind, if we start that at pre-K, we've lost four years of the opportunity to build this brain. And so if you think of it as a house, would you, would you put the planning into the last, the paint on the walls if you don't have the guts of it right and the foundation? And so I, I really think that, in, and this is, I don't think this is earth shattering, but we know that the best intervention is early intervention. And so, especially for our kiddos that have developmental delays, physical delays, cognitive delays, if we can catch those at six weeks and eight weeks and 12 months, rather than at three and four and five years old, we know that kids are like sponges, right? They're, they are learning at a fast pace. And again, going back to if 90% of your brain is developing by age five, we've got to start that at birth. And that, that is a process of educating families. It's a process of giving care to children. And just like the things that Amy talked about, those aren't just preschool uh, indicators or levels of quality. Those really can happen really when this kiddo is, is seeing their first breath in this world, that's really when the opportunities are for these mm -hmm. high quality learning opportunities, not only for those that are able, but those that are not as able um, or are disadvantaged. So I think it's really even more critical to look at those earlier years, even than pre-K. I think we also want to give a shout out to our um, quality rating system in the community. Um, so the state of Colorado has a quality ranking system, level one through level five, level five being the highest quality and level one being you're meeting basic licensing requirements in your program. Um, and so we have two level five centers in Longmont. They are the Aspen Center and Third Avenue Preschool. And then we have eight uh, level four programs. So TLC is one. All four Wild Plum Center sites are four of those eight. Um, Junior Jets, Kinder Care, Primrose, and that's all of them. That's eight. So Good we job. just want to give a shout out to yeah. the level four, level five programs. And again, those indicators of quality are something that are set by the state. So if you're if you're looking around and you're looking at a program called Color Shines, it is similar to or the idea was that in in hotel or restaurant services, you have a, an experience, right? A level, uh, a one star to a five star rating. The better your experience, the better the stars. The idea is that this- The more the stars. The, the more the, the stars, more the better. better. <laughs> Not that you're seeing stars after, but the, the better your experience was. And that's kind of the idea. And so if you look at uh, child care centers or early childhood um, uh, learning opportunities, they are rated based on the quality indicators of all these things we've just talked about at the state level. Um, and and uh, that is one level of a uh, quality indicator. It, and at this point, it is still voluntary. So there are some level ones and twos that I would say are, are lower on the quality level, but are very high quality because it is still a voluntary system for the state of Colorado to participate in that. So it doesn't mean that lower level centers are not quality, it just means that maybe they haven't even gone through the process or they're just starting the process right. of being rated through the state. Well, and also we have the informal child care educators. Right. They're, they're not part of this uh, scale, you know, they don't have all the, the stars, but some of them are providing really good um, services in our yeah. community. Yeah. If you think 25% of the kids attend, you know, to the informal child care, so right there we have a great opportunity. You know, a lot of them are doing really good work, so. And a lot of the children that are in our programs are mm -hmm. in those informal learning Absolutely. settings at other parts right. of the mm -hmm. day or weekends or mm -hmm. late nights or things along those lines too. Right. right. So <clears throat> I've got a question that I'm going to ask about resources and and where they are and, and are they adequate and where are others that may be underutilized. <clears throat> but um, that ties more specifically uh, to some of what we're doing um, through the, the city. Um, uh, in order to, to uh, for this, for every child in this community to be accessing the kinds of quality experiences with formal and informal, mm -hmm. what we're talking about. Um, we have to have a pretty good idea of how many of those kids there are at, in this community. Right. So the mayor's summit last spring, which all three of you were uh, seriously involved with helping to, to design and, and prepare for, uh, what do we think we've learned in the run-up to that? You, you knew it before, but what, what did the rest of us learn mm -hmm. in that summit in terms of um, the kinds of access and the kinds of quality you just talked about in relationship to need. 
Okay. Is, are we addressing 100% of the need? The goal is yeah, right. all of our kids. Well, I think that we were able to identify uh, four, four specific needs, right? Um, one of them is transportation, that we don't have at this point the capacity really to work on that. You know, a lot of uh, the parents mentioned that, you know, they work, you know, some of them would work really early and the childcare is not even open at that time. So I think that we put that in, in the back burner and now we're working with uh, staff development. We identified the staff development is something that we can work now and we're already creating a plan for that. So high quality of staff development. So uh, some of the educators mentioned that uh, they would like to attend, but it's really, uh, the cost is really high. And sometimes just to attend to this, to, to this training, they have to go to different places. So what we're doing is just bringing some that high quality of trainings here in Long Launch and also bringing some coaching. Some of them mentioned, I attend to these uh, trainings, but and then I struggle. And when I'm going to implement right. those new tools or techniques, I need some support. So now we're bringing some coaching. So that's some of the things that we learn. Okay, right. we know that there are evidence-based programs. We know the ones that are working. But I think that we learned that by providing coaching and providing that assistance, we can make a difference because they can implement really uh, the things they're learning in, in these trainings. I, I would I want say to go back to my question. Yeah, yeah, of, yeah, what, yeah. What's the if we think about gap analysis, right? right? Mm -hmm. yeah. We have a solution. Right. Yeah. We have a need. The question is, how much of a gap exists yes. between demand yes. and supply? Right. So I was headed there. Um, I think that uh, one of the things we learned from the summit was that it's really hard to nail down really live, solid numbers of what the need is. What I can tell you is for the low income, that's 100% of federal poverty or below population in Longmont, we have a need of about 400 spaces for those children to find their way into preschool. You have to pair that with the fact that we just don't have enough centers if we have to, enough money, to make that happen. We don't have enough seats. Right, right. we don't have enough right. seats. Capacity. The other thing mm -hmm. we don't have is a workforce. So there are not enough people to hire to become the educators of these children with the kinds of quality background we want those educators to have. It's quite difficult for us to, to find high quality staff and it's, it takes and a to lot retain to them. get there and then and to, to retain, retain them. them. Mm -hmm. and so to give you a couple of numbers, we know that there, there are 32, and this is a, a, a spot in time and sometime in 2019 when we got this data. So it is outdated as of today. But we know that we have around 32 licensed homes in Longmont. We know we have about 40 licensed child care centers in Longmont. And the capacity of those are all different from uh, a home might be two children and a center might be, I don't know, 150, 180. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so the capacity is different from, from a home to a center. But we know that of the, of the licensed homes, and again when we get, get back to quality, the licensed homes, there are 32 of those, and only 6% of those are at those levels four and five of quality through the state. On the flip side, on the centers, we know that we have 40 licensed centers and 25% of those licensed centers are at a level four and five. Now again, it doesn't mean that they're not quality because there are one or two or three, but we know that the higher quality ones that have gone through the ratings are at those levels. Those numbers are still very low to the birth rate of Boulder County and specifically Longmont to what the need is of the workforce for our youngest children birth to five. You layer on top of that, like Amy just talked about, our, our child care assistance programs or those that could access other programs. We have some super programs. The Colorado Child Care Assistance Program, or CCAP, is a program that for eligible families based on their annual household income and the size of their family. Those two things, if they qualify, there are, um, there are 28 of the 40 providers in Longmont that are CCAP providers. Now they might have one child, 12 children, 20 children, but they're at least a CCAP provider. Uh, of the homes, 28% of those homes are CCAP providers. It is still very much under what the capacity or what the need is um, to serve the children in the community. And the CCAP program goes up to 235% of the federal poverty level, so right. it covers a much larger um, span of, of income levels. Right. I'm gonna come it's one assistance program. Right. We're going to come back to, right. to CCAP and what it means and, right. and uh, how utilized or unutilized or how accessed or, uh, or yeah. optimized or suboptimized it is. Um, because uh, those are all issues. I, here's the number that stuck with me, and the data, all the data, that's impressive. In fact, I would like a copy of what you just yeah. did when we're out of here. But somebody told me a long time ago, uh, a mentor, Tim, don't, don't ever believe that the facts speak for themselves or that the truth will set you free, right? Neither of those things are true much of the time. So um, got to translate all those data to meaning, right? Yeah. Uh, so the meaning that stuck for me out of, the, out of that, that uh, mayor summit last spring 
was that we have at least 500 kids every day yeah. parked somewhere. Mm -hmm. With all the good programs, right, and the good experiences kids and families are having, we still have 500 kids. And, and you mentioned if we had 500 seats, or if we had the money, we don't have 500 seats to put all those kids. Right. Mm -hmm. So we have, we still have capacity issues we need to address. Mm -hmm. And we have kids who are underserved, right? right. So, so here's the question. Um, to, to provide more formal and informal learning opportunities for children re does require additional funding. Right? Sure. Um, if we think about uh, the importance of quality, which is which, which some of what Olga talked about in terms of professional development right. and um, uh, making certain that people, individuals are ready, or this rating system that entities, right, programs are ready, uh, all takes us towards quality. Mm -hmm. But there's investments we have to make there. Reliability, right, seems to me to be an equally uh, significant concern that, that they'll be there next week, next month, right. next year. So when my, my, my infant is involved, there's a, there, he's in a quality program or she that might be there for them until they're ready to go into a preschool program or, or into a kindergarten class. And that they've had consistent caregivers. Yeah, like and it's, the, there's a reliability. Right. 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 The, the other third, for me, big variable is sustainability. And that would all go back to funding, right? right. And in this case, funding, given what we think we know the costs of quality are. Right? You commented, Amy, at the, at the outset about the, the um, challenge right, in terms of the workforce mm -hmm. and how many are there and why they stay or don't right, right. in terms of what the, what the benefits are or the remuneration mm -hmm. given the back, given, I know a little bit about your background and, mm -hmm. and your staff and I'm just, I shake my head. Uh, you must work magic to keep that kind of talent for the resources <laughs> available. Magic. I mean, it's your, it's your personality, <laughs> I can tell. But, so, so are, do we, are there use of resources that are underutilized? And I want to go specifically back to CCAP and what, you know, what we are or are not doing. Are we spending every dollar in Boulder County of Colorado Child Assistance Program money effectively? And then um, what would it take, big picture, right? Now, our last panel was about big picture. Right. So I'm asking you to think big picture costs. There was a study that just came out from the Economic Policy Institute that shared some numbers about what this is really going to cost if we're serious about it. Right. So turn that into a question. So, well, no so I, I, you know, we, we know that on average, the, the for a full time child to be in care, it's somewhere around a thousand dollars, nine hundred and fourteen hundred. You can throw out numbers you want, but it's around yeah a month. Uh, and so it's it is it is college tuition to highly educate a young infant toddler or preschooler. So we know that that's, that's right now the going rate, uh, and some of that is high and some of that is low. But those are, those are the costs that it takes to, um, to have a child in child care or in a formal or um, preschool setting. So we know that those are the numbers. Uh, we also know that um, the workforce is vastly underpaid. Uh, and, and the challenge is that as we do a better job of educating our folks, giving them professional development, giving them coaching opportunities, uh, their level of education rises to bachelor's and master's level. And where are those folks going? Are they going to stay in a preschool making an hourly wage of $14 to $16 an hour? Or are they going to become a preschool teacher in a district or a kindergarten teacher in a district with better resources, health insurance, and all the things that are most important to us? And so I think we've kind of got a double-edged sword. We, we want to better train our staff and give them opportunities for higher quality, which then gives these children a better opportunity. But on the flip side, we're losing some of our early childhood teachers to other great professions. And so those are the challenges in dealing with the cost of care and the cost of quality, which is keeping staff. So it really it comes down to money. If we could, if we could pay our qualify, most qualified staff more to be competitive with other industries, we would not lose them to other industries. That, that's really what it comes down to because these folks are working people in our communities just like the rest of us who have a mortgage and light bills and children and um, things like that. So we, we've got to do a better job of paying our, our early childhood professionals and we've got to do a better job of a, a multi-tiered funding source to fund this. You talked about CCAP. CCAP is in Boulder County. Uh, Boulder County committed, I can't remember if it's been two years ago now, but in the last couple of years, CCAP is again it's a it's a state program that's funneled down to the to the counties and individual municipalities and, and typically it's somewhere around 70% of the market rate right so if the market rate is 1100 or 1200 dollars we might be getting 70% of that and so that has been a real deterrence for the early childhood business owner why would i take CCAP at 60 70% when 
I could take a kid at $1,400 a month. Which one would you take if it was surely about running a business? Boulder County committed to raising the level of CCAP so much that uh, taking a CCAP child now is not a financial loser to the drain right. or draining on your on your business anymore. And I think that's a real commitment to our county that is committed to taking the dollars that they get and matching those dollars to better financially support uh, the children that are eligible for CCAP. So that's one thing that has happened. That has raised, I think, the level of providers or the number of providers that are taking CCAP now. Uh, but I still think that's an undereducated uh, group. More providers should take CCAP because it is not a financial drain anymore on the organization. It actually is a is a more sustainable model. All right. Um, uh, the uh, CCAP opportunity, is that money that goes directly to parents or does it go to the provider? It goes to the provider. To the provider. Mm -hmm. the parents, child, if a parent wants to know if they qualify, how would yes, they find out? They need to go through the process to um, It's an apply. application process yeah. 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 with Boulder County. Mm -hmm. All right. So um, we're gonna, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, come to a couple of closing questions here. And one about is how people get involved if they want to. But I'm. But before we do, I just want to make a statement. Um, since we don't have anybody from the school district here, and having spent as much time as I spent in that field, uh, I just want to to reinforce uh, what it means. You're talking about having children school ready, mm -hmm. right? Right. So when they step step into a kindergarten, their executive function is optimized, right? You set the stage for for uh, deferring gratification, mm -hmm. for planning, mm -hmm. for which is the mm -hmm. persistence, right? right, for problem solving. Uh, what that means for a school district is the ability to use, first of all, likely a re reduced number of referrals for special education, mm -hmm. which we know most of those occur in the first couple of years in school because right. teachers don't know what to do with kids right. who haven't developed in this way. Mm -hmm. So you see a spike in special ed referrals for five and six-year-olds. Right. Once we know when kids are in that system, they never get out or seldom get out once they're on an IEP. And the cost associated with over the next 10 or 11 years is astonishing. Yep. Right? Title I, um, uh, dollars that flow to schools that have uh, more student needs, the ability to free those, up to, those dollars up to use them in other ways and less on remediation, which is how they're used, right, to supplement what's going on in schools. So the implication for kids is, is profound. For families, is equally as profound. Sorry, I didn't mean that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> To bump it. It's exciting. But for, for the system, it frees up resources to use in so many different ways right. if we get it right for our youngest. That's why, why all of us have a stake in the youngest by the time they, they step into a kindergarten classroom. All right. Uh, um, I'll get off my uh, soapbox. If people are, we've talked some about people, if they're motivated to get involved, how do they do it? Right. So what's your advice? Somebody says, God, God, that is important enough. I want to, I'm Sorry. willing to dedicate a few hours a month yeah. a week. Well, I see several options, you know, actually next week coming up, we have, uh, we're going to show the film, uh, No Small Matter. So oh, that's one way absolutely. to get involved. Yeah. So on the 30th? On the 30th. In the museum? In the museum. So from uh, 5.30 to see who we'll have like a, a quick uh, dinner and from uh, 6 to uh, 8 o'clock, we're going to be uh, showing the, the film and then we're going to have a discussion. So that's one quick way uh, to get involved. Um, so look on the website, you know, we have our link right there so people can register. So that's one one way. Another way, um, it could be through the Bright Eyes Coalition. So this is a coalition, a group of uh, community members and also different organizations. Bright Eyes has been around for a long time. It has been around, uh, I want to say probably what, like 12? 2003. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Amy. <laughs> right uh, yeah, right. I was actually the first person to run it. So, <laughs> <laughs> so right, there, right there, you know, this coalition was created just to promote high, high uh, high quality of education. So right there, that's uh, one opportunity to get involved. Uh, also, uh, we have um, the the Boulder County Early Childhood Council. Early Childhood Council, of Boulder County. Boulder mm -hmm. County, that's one way. And uh, we also, you know, one way just to to get involved. You know, we created this um, this guide launch the kindergarten. Mm -hmm. So just by being able just to to read through this and learn about a few concrete tools few things that you can do with your kiddo, that's one way to get involved. We also have Parents Involved in Education. It is a, a program where we provide uh, child care, we provide dinner, and those are educational sessions for parents. And uh, so the kids will be playing and learning at the same time that parents are learning something. And also we have some parenting classes, you know, through the youth center. So we have the Lena program, and uh, we have also the nurturing parenting program. So the kids and parents are learning at the same time the same topic. But, you know, it's tailored to the kids, and 
using that kind of vocabulary, and the parent is learning another skill. At the end of the day, they get together and they practice that skill. That's one way to get involved. So they can walk into the, to the Family and Youth Center. Absolutely. Or they can... Mm -hmm. They uh, can email, email us, you. they can walk to the youth center, right. and we will connect them. Yeah. They can also join the board of directors of either of our nonprofit organizations. Right. That's a great way to get involved as well. All yes. Right. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll, we'll uh, extend the invitation in this session like we did the last. The second Monday of every month at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, at least for the time being, we have a coalition that's growing around this. And anybody and everybody's invited to show up. 3 o'clock at St. Peter's Episcopal Church. So, St. Stephen's. I'm sorry, State Stephen's <laughs> Episcopal Church. You are right. Thank you. So, um, here's your back. This is part of the backstory on, on um, early learning opportunities in Longmont. Uh, and the reason it's so important, I'm going to say again, uh, the, stake, the stakes that we all have in this are enormous. They're huge if we don't get it right for the youngest of us. Mm -hmm. So thanks for being here, panel. Uh, for those of you who listen, thanks for staying with us. Stay tuned for the third of these podcasts. That's your backstory. Mm -hmm.